Hello, and welcome to this lecture on the politics of resettlement, or Persilinie, um, as it's generally known in Russian. Um, this lecture is going to talk about uh, migration, uh, mostly of peasant settlers, from European Russia across the Urals uh, to Siberia um, and Central Asia. Um, and I'm going to set this uh, in the context of the wider migration of Europeans uh, into other parts of the world um, in the course of the 19th century, because this is a topic that really needs to be understood comparatively. In other words, um, it's obviously enormously important for the history of Central Asia and the Kazakh steppe itself, uh, but it's also part of a much, much wider um, phenomenon, and it can't really be understood um, uh, except within that framework. So I'm going to say a word or two um, to start with then about the phenomenon of European settler colonialism. Um, and this is really a phenomenon primarily of the 19th century. Um, so European settlement begin, uh, overseas begins much earlier, of course. Um, it begins in the Americas from the 16th century onwards. Uh, but numbers are relatively small um, until the early 19th century, when there's a tremendous explosion uh, in the number of settlers um, leaving Europe for new lands, not just in the Americas, but also um, in Africa and Asia. Um, so if we think of um, settler colonies, um, many of these are within what uh, the historian James Bellich has called the Anglo world, so the USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Um, uh, but of course, there are also um, settler colonies beyond that. So Argentina, for instance, in the Spanish speaking world, Algeria uh, in the French speaking world, um, Manchuria, um, which is a colony of Japan, um, uh, if in the 20th century at least. Um, but if we focus for the moment on the English-speaking world, because that's it's overwhelmingly within that sort of uh, uh, within that division, if you like, that settler colonialism is at its most um, extensive, its most intense. Well, then what we see is that settlers actually come to these English-speaking territories. Uh, from all over the world, uh, they then become acculturated to this Anglophone world. So in other words, you have Germans um, and indeed Russians um, or Italians uh, migrating to the USA and within a generation they've become uh, English speaking, they've become part of that um, Anglo world. And the current dominance of English as a global language has its roots in these migrations of the 19th century. This is basically what makes English the world language. And indeed, if you like, is the reason that you are studying uh, in English now. Um, what is it then that drives this remarkable expansion uh, of population from Europe overseas? Well, some of it is to do with population growth. Um, so most of Europe has high birth rates in the 19th century. France is an exception. Nobody's really quite sure why. Uh, when this is combined with advances in medical science uh, and in public health, uh, which take place in that century, this leads to a very rapid increase in population um, within Europe. So the population of England, uh, leaving out Scotland and Ireland, doubles from 8.3 million in 1801 to 16.8 million in 1851. I mean, that's a really remarkable um, rate of growth. Um, and by 1901, um, it's nearly doubled again to 30.5 million. Um, and these figures don't include, of course, those who emigrated. Um, so that's estimated at about 141,000 people a year between 1870 uh, and 1913. So 6.2 million people uh, in that 40-year period emigrate from England uh, alone. Um, so leaving aside other European countries or indeed Scotland and Ireland within England, which have actually a higher proportion um, of migrants. Um, so much of this, this rapid population increase is absorbed by new industrial jobs, but many nevertheless seek opportunities elsewhere overseas. And most of them are traveling to the USA, which is the most popular destination, even though it's not formally part of the British Empire. It nevertheless has a, uh, a British-style legal system, and of course English um, as, its, um, as its main language. Um, and um, the rates of migration are even higher if we look at uh, marginal rural areas um, within the British Isles, such as Ireland and Scotland, so migration rates are actually higher there. So this is a this is a major phenomenon um, for Britain, which is in the end one of the most prosperous um, 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 places of origin, if you like, um, for for migrants um, 
during the 19th century. Uh, and many, many more are coming from uh, different places in Europe, places like southern Italy, for instance, or Prussia, um, or Poland, um, which are less industrially developed um, and agriculturally more marginal. So what is it then that leads people to migrate? Because it is, of course, a major decision, not an easy one to take. Uh, we have a mixture of push and pull factors. Uh, historians of migration are always looking for these. Push factors that lead people to want to leave, pull factors that draw them to travel to a particular place. So push factors might include land shortages, uh, they might include famine, um, a lack of other employment opportunities, uh, religious or racial discrimination, um, that's certainly very important for the early history of the colonization of the Americas. Many of those who migrate um, are, belong to religious minorities. A desire for social advancement, um, so people feeling that they're sort of stuck uh, in a particular social position in their home society, that they can't um, uh, rise any further up the ladder. Um, pull factors include stories of wealth and opportunity, so you know the, the, the cliche is that the streets in wherever it is that migrants are planning to go, are, are paved with gold. Sudden economic booms. So the classic examples are the gold rushes in California and Melbourne. These suck in hundreds of thousands of people in a very, very short space of time. Technological improvements mean that there are cheaper and more comfortable sea voyages. Um, it becomes um, uh, less risky. It becomes less expensive um, to migrate. Um, and then you have uh, the phenomenon of letters from friends and relatives who've migrated. This is what historians call chain migration. In other words, uh, one member of a family or one member of a community migrates somewhere and they start writing letters home in which they say, gosh, it's wonderful here, you must come and join me. Now that, of course, is um, uh, uh, something that's particularly uh, important for the Anglosphere because in the Anglosphere has, has very high levels of literacy. And it's one of the things that helps to explain why um, uh, migration is such an important phenomenon um, in that particular area. So settler colonialism is not just, however, um, an Anglophone phenomenon. Um, so you have the French-speaking minority in Canada, the Afrikaners, the Dutch speakers in South Africa. Uh, although they come under British rule, they remain largely unassimilated. They continue to speak their native language. You have Italian and Spanish settlement in Argentina and in other Latin American states. You have the French settlers in Algeria. Many of them are actually Spanish or Italian or Maltese in origin, but they become French-speaking. The Japanese colonization of Taiwan, Korea, and Manchuria. And then finally, the example that concerns us here, the Russian colonization of Siberia, Central Asia, and Transcaucasia. Um, and I'm going to make a brief historiographical digression here um, because there is... Um, uh, a thesis, if you like, or an argument um, within the history of colonization, which um, I think it's important for you to know about, put forward by um, Professor James Bellich. Now, Bellich um, is originally from New Zealand. He's now Professor of Imperial History at Oxford, and he's advanced a new theory um, as to how and why migration and European expansion takes place in this period. And he argues that it can't really just be explained by rational economic and institutional arguments. Um, if, you know, if we look at the numbers, we see that um, you know, there's the, 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 there aren't enough employment opportunities, there isn't enough prosperity, there aren't the kinds of resources or the um, sort of um, possibility of sudden rises in living standards um, in the places that people are migrating to. Um, uh, they don't correspond, in other words, to the image that people have of them. Uh, and he says that what he refers to as explosive colonization, and that's the sudden increases in population, is produced by sudden irrational bursts of economic optimism. Um, and there are some really spectacular examples of this. So in 1830, Chicago only had 100 people. By 1871, 40 years later, it had 1.1 million people. Melbourne didn't even exist in 1835. By 1891, it had 473,000 people. Now, Though that kind of rate of urban growth is simply unprecedented in the history of the world. Um, and in neither case do local industries, gold, um, trade, meat packing, provide sufficient explanation for such explosive growth. Um, you know, it's not that, these that there are such incredible opportunities there that people are flooding in and immediately sort of getting very well-paid jobs. Um, instead, it's an irrational belief that these places are wealthy, that these opportunities are there. Um, 
It's a boom which in, its, in a way is sort of feeding off itself. So early settler economies then, according to Belich, are characterized by a frantic boom that is largely based on what he calls the progress industry. So in fact, it's, it's the building of infrastructure to serve these um, uh, new migrants, towns, railways, and other infrastructure, uh, the provision of services to those who are coming. Um, you know, so the, 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 the sort of the joke, if you like, is um, you know, the way to get rich during a gold rush is not to go and prospect for gold, it's to open a restaurant um, serving food to the gold miners, or perhaps even better, a bar serving them alcohol. Um, uh, this is how fortunes um, are made. Um, so these booms are then followed by a sudden bust. There's an economic collapse. Optimism drains away. And then there's a recovery. And this is based upon uh, the export of resources um, uh, or the production or processing of raw materials. So grain in Canada, wool and meat uh, in Australia. And that proves to be a more sustainable recipe um, for growth. But the initial impulse is as much cultural as economic. Um, it's an irrational belief that the growth of new settler colonies would continue at a rapid rate without any obvious means of support. That sucks in large populations, and then in a, in a way that gives colonization its own momentum, we can say. So if you look at these um, images here of 19th century Chicago and Melbourne, we get a sense of what these sort of, what these boom cities look like, these, these mushroom cities that sprang up overnight. Um, yes, and there are the figures again, really quite extraordinary. So how does this work then in Russia? Does Russia fit this sort of paradigm? Well, European and American travelers um, often compared Irkutsk uh, or other Siberian towns, uh, which were full of casinos and gold millionaires, to the American West. It's a very, very common comparison um, uh, uh, made by travelers um, in this region. Um, now, the figures that we have for Russian population growth and migration to Asia are not 100% accurate uh, for a number of reasons. One is that there's only one complete census of the Russian Empire taken uh, in the course of the 19th century uh, in 1897. Another is that um, we don't have the equivalents that we have for Britain, say, where we can sort of calculate the numbers by looking at shipping manifests. You know, we can see who is registered as a migrant when they get on the boat. Um, but of course, for a peasant to move beyond the Urals, which is what we're talking about here, from European into Asian Russia, was a much less decisive step than taking the boat to Australia. Um, and indeed, many of them would go, have a look at what they found there, and then they would come back. Um, um, and there are not, you know, the, the records that are kept of, of movement are not completely accurate. Um, but even the official figures show over 4 million peasants migrating between 1896 and 1914. So, you know, that's in a period of just 18 years. Um, if we include unofficial migrants um, and those who migrated before 1896, uh, the total who migrate um, to Asia from European Russia in that period is probably about 6 million. And that's certainly comparable to the number who migrate from Britain um, in a rather longer time period, in fact, from the 1870s through to the uh, early 1900s. So certainly in terms of sheer numbers, um, uh, um, Russia's sort of movement, the Russian Empire's movement of peasant settlers is certainly comparable um, to what we see um, in uh, um, the wider Anglosphere, as it were. Um, so here, just to keep you um, entertained, uh, a few images of 19th century Irkutsk, uh, the town that is most often compared to a sort of an American Wild West frontier town by visitors. Um, and this expansion, uh, this migration, um, of peasants by the early 1900s, certainly by 1914, um, has become a major part, in a way, of the, the state's self-image, um, uh, of the ideologies of Russian, uh, of the Russian Empire and, above all, of um, the modernization of that empire. So this is a quotation from the introduction uh, to a book called Asiatskaya Rasiya, uh, which was published in St. Petersburg in 1914, by an organization called the Perisilenchesko Upravlinie, um, and I will um, explain what that was um, uh, um, shortly. Um, and what um, uh, the author, G. V. Glinka, who is the director of the Perisilenchesko Upravlinie, is saying here um, uh, is basically that um, the movement of people, um, uh, um, the colonization of the sort of uh, the state boundaries of Russia, is something that is absolutely sort of 
essential to an understanding of Russian history. And here um, he's quoting, basically, the very famous Russian historian Vasily Klutchevsky, um, who published his um, uh, a very popular uh, course of Russian history uh, um, in 1911. Uh, the history of Russia is the history of a country that colonizes itself. Um, the idea then is that, in a way, sovereignty or effective sovereignty um, is um, uh, being um, brought to the borderlands of the Russian Empire through this great movement of people. Now this celebration or encouragement of migration and settlement actually comes quite late in Russian history. So historically um, the Russian state has not encouraged migration because it's always suffered from chronic shortages of labor. You know, Russia has lots of land, it doesn't have very many people. Uh, so its laws are mainly directed at tying peasants to the land and forbidding movement. And this is actually the origin of Russian serfdom which is not a medieval survival, but something that's actually introduced uh, in the 17th century as a means of trying to sort of keep control of a scarce labor supply. Um, so migration of peasants to Asia is the last thing that the state um, wants to encourage or permit. Um, the Cossacks, Kazaki in Russian, were an exception, but they had a special legal status. Uh, and to begin with, many of them were actually neither Slavic nor Christian. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit here about um, Cossack settlement because this is the earliest form of colonization that we find um, in Central Asia. Uh, so the first Russian settlements on the Kazakh steppe then are Cossack Stanitsas. Um, and these included the Ural Cossacks, uh, the oldest group uh, formed in the early 17th century, which included many Bashkirs and other Turkic Muslims, the Orenburg and uh, the Siberian Cossacks. Um, so they receive large grants of land in return for military service, um, land which Russian officials often complain they did not use productively. Um, as I've mentioned, um, many of these Cossacks are not actually Slavs. They're not necessarily Orthodox Christians. And that's because to be a Cossack uh, is to be a member of a legal estate. A Saslovia, you have certain privileges from the state, you owe the state certain duties um, in return. It's not actually tied to ethnicity or to religion. Um, and um, as late as the 19th century, many of the Ural Cossacks are, uh, are not actually Russian or Christian. And many of those who are, are old believers, and they actually have a rather troubled relationship with the Russian state. They rebel against it frequently. Um, you will obviously have heard in a previous lecture about the, uh, the Pugachev revolt, which um, originates amongst the what are then called the Yaik uh, Cossacks, uh, which gives you an idea then of how, how um, their relationship with the Russian state could be rather antagonistic. Um, Cossacks are reluctant to settle any further south than the um, fortified lines the Russian state has established, partly because of the climate, partly also for security. Um, but the Siberian Cossacks do create a new line of Stanitsas along the Chinese border and into Semirechi in the 1850s, uh, and this became the new Semirechi Cossack host in 1867. The Semirechi Cossack host is one of the last ones to be formed under the Russian Empire, and is basically a an offshoot of the West Siberian uh, Cossack host and is based, as its name suggests, um, uh, in, uh, in and around modern-day uh, Almaty and Bishkek. Now, Cossack uh, relations with their Kazakh neighbors um, vary a good deal. Um, so here's a quotation from um, uh, an article uh, in Sibirsky Vyestnik, published in Omsk in 1889, by uh, an author called Alim Bekov. Uh, we don't know much about him, except that presumably he was Kazakh, unless he was a Russian writing under a, a Kazakh pseudonym, but I think he was Kazakh. Um, and here he is um, uh, describing how often the Cossack women very naively explain the reason for their lawsuits against the Kyrgyz. Now then, forgive me, how do you imagine a Cossack can live unless it be at the expense of this Basurman, which is a corruption of Muslim or Muslim? Um, but the relationship is certainly not wholly um, or exclusively hostile. Um, there are many elements of symbiosis. So Cossacks uh, borrowed esten extensively from Kazakh material culture in their clothing. Uh, they also borrowed from them in their language um, and um, uh, in their um, livestock breeding techniques as well. The Cossacks learned haymaking and other agricultural techniques from Cossacks and certainly um, uh, were more likely to engage in sedentary agriculture if they were um, uh, living close to Cossack um, stanitsas. Uh, and of course, the very word Cossack, Kazakh in Russian, um, has exactly the same Turkic root as Kazakh, uh, 
this is not a coincidence. So, leaving aside the Cossacks then, um, we return to the question of peasant settlement, and overwhelmingly the settlers who come in the 19th century are peasant settlers, they're not members of the Cossack estate. Um, this process begins really in the 1840s, so that's when you see the first law that officially permits peasant migration. Up until that point, officially peasants are not allowed to migrate, they're not allowed to move. Many of them do, but they're doing so um, uh, illegally, effectively. Um, the reason for the change in the law is partly because of land hunger in central regions of Russia, uh, and it's also because of the opening up of the Black Sea steppes um, after the uh, fall of the Crimean Khanate um, uh, creates an impulse for colonization. Um, but at this stage, many of the colonists are actually not Russian. Um, many of them are German, they also bring in Bulgarians, they bring in Jews, in fact, uh, um, uh, to colonize these, these new lands, Novorossiya, as it's called at that time, uh, or Torida, um, in what's now southern Ukraine. Um, so this is the text of the law, um, which just states very boldly that um, the resettlement, Perisilinia, that word will recur, uh, of state peasants has twin purposes. Uh, a, so that agricultural communities which stand in need of land can be granted a sufficient amount for the remaining souls once the settlers have left, and B, so that spare hands in one place can be transferred to others for the cultivation of areas lying empty. And there, in a nutshell, you really have the whole, if you like, developmental logic of Perisilinia as it will evolve in the course of the 19th century. It's supposed to take people from areas where there's not enough land and bring them to areas that are supposedly empty. Um, the question is, of course, whether those areas are actually empty or whether they're being used by other people for different purposes. Um, a really important piece of legislation is passed in 1889. Um, this is an explicit authorization of peasant settlement beyond the Urals. Um, so if you look at the text of the law, it mentions the strategic need for settlers to protect vulnerable borderland regions such as Simirici. Um, it also allows um, peasants to apply uh, to the Ministry of Internal Affairs for permission to migrate, uh, specifying their preferred region. The Department of State Domains is then supposed to identify and allocate them a plot. So migration is not only going to be permitted by the state, but in principle um, is going to be sort of managed and facilitated by it, although, as we'll see, it takes some time for that actually to become um, uh, an important um, factor. So settlers in the so-called Asiatic provinces of Tomsk, Tobolsk, Akmolinsk, Semipalatinsk, Semirechia are given their plots on terms of permanent use uh, by the state, together with three years' exemption from taxation and military service. So they're really trying to encourage settlement with this statute. And this is a major sort of change um, in thinking, and it's specifically targeted at bringing peasants across the Urals from European Russia into Asiatic Russia, um, and the impulse uh, or the logic behind it is partly developmental, but it's also um, security based. It's about sort of filling up these supposedly empty lands with Slavs to make them more secure. And we see a very uh, um, revealing response to this from this same Alimbekov um, uh, in, in an article entitled Golos Kirgiza Zasilini Stepi Kirgizkoi Perisiliensumi, published in Sibirsky Vestik in 1889. Uh, and he says, Peresilenčski vopros stal žgučkim i dla Kirgiz, v nedavnje vreme jim ani savsem ne interesovali, iba ni boli uvereni takda v tom, što peresilenčske dviženje jih savsem ne kasnjoca. No s teh por, kak gazeti saopšili o prepolagajamom izdani novega zakonoprojekta v poredačenje peresilenji, mežu pročim i v stepnih oblastjah, pasnejše jih ravnodušje k njemu smenilo s trevožnim bezpokojstvom. Prava, jes za što im bez pakojca. Na jazike Kirgiz eto značit byt ili ne byt, žit ili ne žit na povjetnosti zemlji. So, um, the language is quite dramatic here, but basically what he's saying then is that um, uh, the, the Kazakhs, the Kirgiz, as the Russians called them at that time, previously were not really concerned about the, the, the Perisilenčski vapros, the resettlement question. Now that the law has passed, and he's referring here to the 1889 statute, um, they suddenly realize that this is going to affect them as well, and their previous equanimity with regard to it um, uh, has changed um, into uh, uh, a severe anxiety. And he says, yes, indeed, there are there is something to worry about here. Um, in our language, in the language of the Kazakhs, this means um, you know, to be or not to be, to live or not to live um, on the face of the earth.
So in 1896, um, the uh, process of resettlement um, becomes regularized with the establishment of um, a special resettlement administration, Pedicidinchesco uh, Pravlinia, within the Ministry of, of Internal Affairs. And so this is really a turning point in the politics of colonization. Um, it's the beginning of a systematic, state-driven policy of exporting peasants from the crowded uh, central regions uh, of um, European Russia, you know, the, the Black Earth regions, the central agricultural region around Moscow, uh, to Siberia, the Asiatic steppe, uh, and Turkestan. Um, and the numbers of settlers increased hugely um, with the opening of the Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, and Siberia's economy begins to boom at this period. It has a, a massive agrarian boom, driven in large part by the improvement of communications brought by the Trans-Siberian Railway. Um, and any of you who have ever been to Petropavlovsk um, or to Omsk uh, will know um, what I'm talking about. I mean, these are towns that are um, uh, not created by the railway, but which grow enormously uh, as a result of the railway arriving there after um, 1891. Um, and you know, if you go through the centre of Omsk today, uh, you will not only see um, um, this enormous bridge um, over the river Irtysh, um, but you will see um, the headquarters of the Trans-Siberian Railway is still there, um, a, a huge, sort of rather splendid um, uh, early 20th century building. And this is reflected then in things like on the left here, you'll see, um, I'm very fond of this poster, it's an advertisement for um, a firm making agricultural machinery um, in Omsk, um, which first of all exemplifies um, the application of what at that time is, is, is sort of new industrial technology um, to agriculture and in particular to grain production, but also you'll see at the centre um, uh, the helmeted figure of Ataman Yermak, the sort of legendary conqueror um, of um, Siberia um, in the late 16th century. Um, and there on the right is um, the guide to the Great um, Siberian Railway from 1900, um, because it is also um, sort of marketed in a way as a, a, a tourist attraction. So what are then are the push and pull factors specifically for Russian peasant migration? We talked about them more broadly in the history of European migration, but of course there are specifics here. Well, one of them is indeed land hunger, especially in central Russia. There's not enough agricultural land to go around. Um, it's um, farmed very inefficiently within peasant communes, um, which um, many people want to leave. Uh, famine. There is a severe famine in Russia in 1892, partly produced by the El Nino uh, climatic effect uh, that drives a lot of people um, into Central Asia. Attachment to the commune uh, or near uh, and lack of individual land rights is something that pushes some people away. They want to be able to be independent proprietors um, and for that they need to leave the commune and to find um, new land in Siberia. Religious persecution is a factor uh, for the old believers, for instance, uh, for the Dukhaborci, um, who will become um, important uh, settlers in the Transcaucasian region. What about the pull factors? Well, there are reports of rich tracts of completely empty land. Of course, the land is not really entirely empty, but that's how it's presented. Um, tales of astonishing fertility, um, so giant vegetables and so on, of uh, um, uh, a warm climate producing um, uh, a rich agricultural harvest. Uh, gold is important. That's certainly true in eastern Siberia. Government assistance and encouragement, um, of course, um, we've already seen how that is getting underway, uh, and we can add to that um, uh, the uh, um, much easier transportation provided by the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, and there's no nobility or noble estates in Siberia. That's also very attractive for many peasants. Um, that they will not have to, they will not have to deal with nobles uh, as they are dvorianstva, uh, as they will do in European Russia. Um, how does this process take place then? Well, the state does produce guides uh, and other forms of propaganda to encourage Pedicilinia. Um, and one of those is pictured here um, on the left. Um, but the most crucial role in determining patterns of settlement is played by a figure, the figure of the Chodok, or scout. So a group of families or a whole village would club together, pay the expenses of somebody, um, uh, sometimes a professional, sometimes somebody who... Uh, lived and worked in the village with them, to survey uh, the resettlement areas um, in Siberia and Central Asia for likely plots of land. 
Um, the Hodok would then come back and would report, and depending on what they reported, the village might decide to move. So this partly reflects the fact that Russian peasant society, unlike um, Anglo societies, is largely illiterate. Um, so um, the, uh, the sort of information flow that leads to chain migration doesn't come in the form of letters um, or, um, necessary, or newspaper reports so much as it does uh, through uh, word of mouth reports. So what sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, there are brief falls during the Boxer Rebellion in 1900, during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-5, but the number of migrants increases very, very rapidly. Um, in 1896, there are 200,000 of them, um, officially. Then there's a smaller, probably a smaller number of unofficial migrants who don't register. In 1908, according to the official statistics, the annual number of migrants across the Urals reached a peak of 750,000 in just one year. Uh, of these, 120,000 went back to European Russia, but even so, if we include the unregistered migrants, those who didn't um, make their presence known to the authorities, the total is probably something close to a million. Um, so collectively then, between 1896 and 1909, 3.6 million registered migrants crossed the Urals, and of these, just 870,000 returned. Unsurprisingly then, uh, demand for land far outstrips supply. Um, at this point. Um, and the ideology surrounding resettlement on the, 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 the sort of image of Siberia in the Russian imagination completely changes at this time. So the old Siberia is a place of exile, of punishment, uh, exemplified by that, that photograph on the left here, um, where you see um, a criminal, uh, who, a convict, who had been branded and who had received lashes. Um, but then on the right you have a uh, um, a, a, a publication about Siberia, about settlement in Siberia, and about the new life that people can create there. Um, so by this stage, then, Perisilenia, resettlement, uh, has been transformed. Um, it was once something very reluctantly permitted by Russian officials, and now it's become a central plank uh, of a policy of rural modernization. Uh, and that policy is identified above all with two individuals, Prime Minister Pyotr Stolipin, whom you see there on the left, and Alexander Krivoshen, uh, who from 1908 uh, is the head of the Glavnoi Upravlenie Zimnedelie Zimliustroistva, or GUZIS, uh, the uh, main state administration for um, agriculture and lands, uh, and sort of land settlement, um, who between them are really sort of the architects of this much, much more organize also much more aggressive policy of funneling settlers into Asian Russia. Uh, now, Stalipin is best known for a set of agrarian reforms in European Russia, uh, which are to do with um, dissolving the peasant commune, the Mir, uh, dividing its lands into separate peasant smallholdings, or Kutor. Um, but Perisilenia is an essential preliminary step to this process uh, as a means of reducing the pressure on land. Okay, so what does this mean then for the Kazakh steppe specifically? Well, Western Siberia, Tomsk and Tobolsk, and above all the Altai, are the most popular destinations for peasant settlers, but a substantial proportion of them also settle on the Kazakh steppe. Um, the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railway allows them to travel as far as Chelyabinsk, Petropavlovsk, or Omsk by rail, uh, and the main regions of settlement in the steppe are the Akmolinsk and Turgai provinces, uh, followed by Semipalatinsk, Semirechie, and finally Sirdaria in the south. By the early 1900s, then, this has begun to really transform the demographic profile um, of the northern steppe. So this is a contemporary map taken from that same publication, Asiatska Rasia, showing the main areas of resettlement um, in Asiatic Russia, and you can see um, uh, areas there in the northern uh, and in the southern steppe that correspond roughly to modern-day Kazakhstan, um, uh, which um, are indicated here. And if we enlarge that, then you can see uh, numbers are sort of posted there on each of them. Uh, 3,200 in Siadaria, 67,800 in Senirechie, 460,000 um, in um, uh, the Turgai Oblast, 640,000 in uh, Akmolinsk and 101,000 um, in Semipalatinsk. And these are, if anything, probably underestimates because these are based on the official figures. Uh, this is a diagram that um, gives another view and helps you to sort of contextualize this within the overall uh, 
number um, of settlers. So you can see there on the left, that big, big bulge is Tomsk province, which has the single largest number um, of um, settlers. And it also shows how settler settlement really spikes after 1906. Um, it becomes much, much more rapid um, in that period. Um, so this little uh, bar here um, is the uh, Sirdaria province. This one is Semidechi. This is Semipalatinsk. This is Akmolinsk, which, as you can see, is one of the largest. It receives very large numbers of settlers. Uh, and then finally, this one here is Turgai. Um, so, you know, looking at that, we can see that settlement in the Kazakh steppe makes up roughly a third, certainly, of um, all the settlement that's taking place uh, after uh, the period after 1906. Um, and the settlers, of course, um, Establish themselves in some cases in rural areas, in some cases in existing towns and settlements, um, which grow um, substantially as a result. Uh, um, again, these images are taken from this publication, the Pedisilensky School Problemia. This is the town of Kapal in the northern part of Semidechi, originally a Cossack stanitsa, set up in the late 1840s, um, which grows into a, a settler town in this period. Um, this is, of course, familiar to anybody who is an Almatinets. Um, uh, the uh, the beautiful um, uh, um, uh, cathedral, uh, wooden cathedral, or the, the Zienkov Cathedral, is often known after its architect, um, in what was then Almaty, and is, uh, what was then Vierne, and is now um, Almaty. So here are the figures sort of shown um, uh, in table form. Um, uh, as you can see, the... Um, uh, the total numbers are um, much higher in the northern part of the steppe um, than in the south. Turkestan and Semidechi um, received many, many fewer settlers. The figures for Turkestan and Semidechi are probably very severely underestimated, um, not least because Semidechi um, is actually officially closed to migrants uh, throughout most of this period. Um, quite a lot of migrants make their way there anyway, um, but of course they are... Um, de facto uh, unregistered, and therefore they don't show up in the official figures. And for various reasons, migration to Semidech in Turkestan is particularly problematic, particularly causes a particularly large amount of friction, uh, as we'll see in a moment. So we've talked about um, laws that permit penicillinia more broadly or encourage it. Within Central Asia, and in particular, uh, on the Kazakh steppe, uh, the crucial piece of legislation is the 1891 steppe statute. Um, the Polozhenie Obupravlenie Oblasti Akmolinskoy, Semipalitinskoy, Semirechinskoy, Uralskoy, Turgaiskoy, which basically um, covers most of the territory of modern Kazakhstan, with the exception of the Sirdaria um, Oblast, which is in Turkestan. Now, Article 120 of this statute um, pay attention, this is really important. Um, I know I'm getting very specific here, but there's a reason for that. Article 120 states that land occupied by nomads remains in indefinite collective use of the nomads on the basis of custom and the rules of this statute. So that gives the um, nomads um, of the Kazakh steppe the right of polzovanie, uh, of use of the land. It doesn't give them property rights, but it does give them uh, the right to the land that they use. But there's a note added to this, and the note, the devil is in the detail, as we might say. A note added that land which appears to be surplus to requirements, and the term that's used here is izlishki, remember that term, izlishki, it's important, which appears to be surplus to requirements for the nomads will come under the direction of the Ministry of Public Properties. Uh, this apparently innocuous clause would become the legal justification for the expropriation of Kazakh land until the end of the imperial period. Um, so how do they decide, you know, what land is surplus? Um, well, they do it on the basis of surveys. Um, and the most important of these surveys um, is conducted by something called the Sherbina Commission. Uh, and this is set up in 1896 uh, when the Committee for the Trans-Siberian Railway, uh, which, of course, is running through the northern part of the Kazakh steppe uh, at Petropavlovsk, uh, dispatches an expedition to that uh, region led by the statistician A.F.A. Sherbina. And it includes amongst its staff, um, somebody you will all have heard of, uh, the Kazakh intellectual Alikhan Bukekhanov. Now, the purpose of the commission was to assess the suitability of land for agriculture and the likely impact of peasant settlement on the economy of the Kazakhs. Um, uh, but um, uh, 
as we'll see, the sort of the, the implications or the consequences of this are go considerably beyond that. Um, after five years' research, the expedition concluded that while Kazakhs were turning to settled agriculture themselves in ever greater numbers, they used less land than Russian settlers. And this became the basis of so-called normi, norms of land, required by each Kazakh household. Everything above this was izlishki. So in other words, they come up with uh, an average calculation of how much each pastoral Kazakh household requires and how much each sedentary Kazakh household requires. Um, they make a rough calculation then on the basis of the population of each in a particular region um, and how much land they will need, and then they try to work out what the surplus is. Um, that sounds like a very sort of accurate and scientific process. Um, in practice, however, it wasn't. So we see um, here um, uh, another image, again, from Asiatska Rasia, showing a topographer carrying out a survey, um, in this case for the setting up of a, a new settlement um, in the Kazakh steppe. So the officials of the Resettlement Administration um, make use of the data produced by the Shedbina Commission, um, but they make use of it in ways that basically suit their own agenda. Uh, so they argue that the land needs of the Kazakhs were actually diminishing because they were turning to settled agriculture. In other words, um, because more and more Kazakhs were um, abandoning pastoralism and becoming agriculturalists, they needed less land, uh, and therefore the quantity of land identified as Izlishki could be expanded still more. And they also applied Sherbina's norms, which had been developed in the northern steppe, to regions such as Semirechi, which had a very different agrarian economy. Um, now, in fact, the growing sedentarization of the nomadic population ensured that they would come into direct competition with settlers for the best arable land, because, of course, as everybody knows, you know, not all land is the same. Some land is good for pasture, some land is good for growing crops, some land is good for neither. Um, and uh, uh, um, in many cases, no distinction at all was made between um, these different um, types of land. So, um, the Pedicidensical Pravlenia then are increasingly becoming um, what uh, the historian Peter Holquist has called a technocracy. Uh, or rather, he describes them specifically as having a technocratic ideology. What does he mean by that? Um, well, um, the officials of the Pedicidensical Pravlenia are proud of their technical education. They're convinced of the progressiveness of the modern technologies that they wish to apply to the empire's land and water. Um, and this meant that they were generally quite far to the left in their politics, um, but it may, left them still unsympathetic to native peoples and agricultural techniques, which they stigmatized as being backward. Um, so in other words, they really thought that the, the knowledge that they brought with them was more important than anything that they could learn on the spot, as it were. And in this we can see how um, the most liberal elements of Russian opinion are really allied with the most ruthless aims of the late Tsarist state. So this might seem a little bit counterintuitive. Um, you know, we tend to think of, I suppose, of colonialism or colonization as being, a, uh, if we think of it as a sort of having a specific political profile at all, it would be, a, I suppose, a right wing or a conservative one. But actually, these men are not conservatives at all. In many cases, they're revolutionaries, actually. They're certainly um, quite radical in their politics. They see themselves as serving the cause of progress by um, pushing aside or marginalizing what they see as more backward forms of agricultural production associated with nomadism on the steppe and introducing more um, uh, up-to-date agricultural techniques. Uh, and of course that assumption is enormously problematic in all sorts of ways. Firstly because um, in many cases um, the kinds of agriculture they're proposing are just not suitable for the land in question. Secondly because um, uh, unsurprisingly um, the local population, whether Kazakh or Kyrgyz, um, tends to be better uh, at coping with local agricultural conditions than Russian settlers are. Um, and thirdly, of course, because um, underlying all of this uh, is the assumption that um, incoming settlers, who are mostly Slavic, mostly from Russia and from Ukraine, um, have um, a greater right to the land than the people who already live there. And that, of course, is one of the sort of main underlying ideologies of all settler colonialism. So we have here a quotation from one of these young technocrats. 
uh, a chap called Georgi Gins, um, who is writing here in the House Journal of the Perisidensko Pravlenie, which, revealingly enough, is called Vaprosi Kolonizatsi. And he says, uh, The slow growth in the numbers of the Russian population of the region has long given the advantage to the conservative tendency over that of cultural constructiveness and of Asiatshina over European influences. And Asiatshina, of course, is a sort of an almost untranslatable term indicating a sort of Asiatic backwardness, I suppose, or sloth. This is why, whilst relating to the native population with complete goodwill, we cannot fail to repeat limits must be placed upon the further expansion of the area of native agriculture. Everything remaining beyond these limits must be transferred to the Russian population. Then a sturdy bulwark of the Russian state will be created in Turkestan and Transcaucasia. So we see here in, in what Gins is saying a very strong ideological element as well. Um, it's not just a question of um, more rational or more productive agricultural development, although that's clearly part of what he's talking about. Um, this is specifically a Russifying agenda. It has an ideological component, which is about um, reinforcing um, the Russian state's claim to these regions by populating them with Russians, great Russians. Um, and um, obviously an implied civilizational hierarchy where he talks about Asiatina as something backward by comparison with Europe. Um, what does he mean, however, when he talks about um, uh, the slow growth in the numbers of the population of the region has given advantage to the conservative tendency over that of cultural constructiveness? Well, here, what he's referring to actually is the opposition of the local administration in Central Asia to the process of Pirisilinia. So if we look at the cover of that guide to Pirisilinia's Aural in 1908, which I showed you earlier, um, you'll see that it has a sticker stuck on it saying, If Turkestan in Kafkaz, Pirisilinia ne Now why is it then, in 1908 apparently, Pirisilinia is not permitted um, in Turkestan or indeed in the Caucasus? Well, the answer um, is basically that um, uh, although the Pedestinetical Pravlenia, which is a St. Petersburg agency, is obviously very keen to promote as much settlement as possible, um, many local administrators, so these are the military men who served as Uyezni Nachalniki or Vajenni Gubernatori, um, are deeply opposed to it. And they're opposed to it for a number of reasons. One is that they feel it's going to make their... Um, it's going to make their jobs more difficult, that it's going to cause discontent amongst the local population, that it might even provoke rebellion, um, and that um, uh, um, it's, it's simply not worth the trouble involved. Another is that they often despise the settlers. They see them as being drunken, unproductive, um, uh, difficult to administer, uh, lowering the prestige of Russia as an imperial power in the region. And thirdly, they really don't like the officials of the Pirisilinsko Pravlenia, who are usually um, more technically educated than them, who come into the region um, with a certain arrogance, whom they suspect of having um, radical political views with which they strongly disagree. Um, so there's a real clash of, within the Russian imperial administration between the uh, statisticians and the technocrats of the um, Pirisilinsko Pravlenia, some of them pictured there, um, and uh, between the local military officials. And here we come to um, one of our most interesting sources um, for the study of this, this last period of Pirisilinia before the outbreak of the First World War, um, which is the memoirs and report of Senator Count uh, Konstantin Konstantinovich von der Palin. Uh, Palin was a Baltic German aristocrat. Um, he was sent on a... Um, uh, an expedition to Turkestan um, uh, in 1908 to 1909, um, what was called the Senatorska Revizia. Um, so if any of you are familiar with um, Gogol's uh, Revizor, well, this is the kind of thing in principle that we're talking about here. Palin was sent to, to root out corruption and to encourage reform. But one of the reforms he was supposed to be encouraging was um, opening up the region to Pedicilinia. And actually, he ended up arguing precisely the opposite after talking to local officials. So this is a quotation from his memoirs in which he attacks the technocracy of the Pedicilinsko Pravlenia. He's talking here about the normi, the norms of land use. These magic formulae were to be derived from statistical research which would show the exact number of acres needed by a toiler in any different given district. In order to be able to follow the latest scientific methods of husbandry with the means at his disposal, 
So far as I remember, these figures produced by a learned statistician with a long record of work for the government of Orenburg, this is Scherbina, were 30 hectares or thereabouts per nomad, old and young inclusive, and 6 hectares per farmer. The following reasoning was there applied. Here is a district belonging to the Tsar. It is, contains X number of hectares and is inhabited by Y number of nomads. As each nomad is entitled to 30 hectares, the total amount of land due to them is Y multiplied by 30. Deduct that figure from the total acreage of the area, and you have a balance, N, which should be handed over to the settlers, QED. Um, now, Palin is saying this in a spirit of mockery. Um, he's saying this because he's saying it's completely absurd. You're not looking at the quality of the land. Um, you're not sort of considering whether the land that you're expropriating might actually already be under cultivation. And as we'll see, that turns out to be the most sort of explosive element of this. Um, in his report, Palin makes very similar points. Um, and um, this comes from the conclusion of the volume of the report about uh, Perisilenia, Perisilenia Diela. The goal of Russifying the region, Sielobrusinia Kraya, by means of forcibly disseminating Russian nationality is also unattainable, at least through resettlement. And so, remember what Ginz has written. Um, this is Palin basically saying that this is a crazy idea. All those attracted to resettle in the borderlands by the free distribution of land and government loans turn out to be, as experience shows, the weakest elements of the Russian peasantry and petty bourgeoisie and also the sweepings of Siberian colonization. No, he didn't think much of these settlers, did he? Possessing considerable privileges when compared with the natives in their relations with their administration, they provoke the native population, which considers itself aggrieved through the forcible requisition of land and water, and sow the seeds of national discord and enmity which could soon have consequences. Um, and the original is, Nakladivayet simina nacionalnoy rozni v narodčeskom kraje. So Palin basically is predicting ethnic conflict if this process of expropriation of land in order to give it to settlers continues. Um, and he's basing uh, his conclusions on uh, partly on his conversations with local officials, but also on the many, many, many petitions um, and other um, letters that his commission receives um, from um, the local population, also from settlers. This is perhaps one of the most interesting ones. Um, from the village of Novotroitska in the Bielovodska oblast, um, which is um, right next door to Pishpek, a modern Bishkek. Uh, and here they describe um, how they live in this village of Novotroitska, how they now have um, uh, more than twice as many people uh, as they had when they were originally set up. They don't have enough land. Um, the Kyrgyz um, uh, refuse to rent them land. Um, uh, and uh, um, they talk about how there's competition for water, how there's growing uh, hostility between them. Now, this is a particularly um, important case because uh, uh, this vi particular village sees a truly horrendous massacre um, uh, in 1916 at the time of the uprising, which I will talk about in a moment. Um, initially, uh, a, lot, a certain number of settlers are killed. Subsequently, over 500 uh, Kyrgyz are basically murdered um, in cold blood outside the village. And we can see the origins of that uh, conflict, um, of that um, uh, uh, I suppose that of that violence um, in this um, in this petition um, here. So Palin produces this four hundred page report, basically saying Pedicilinia um, is not working, and he's talking here about Sirdaria and about Sibirici. Um and um, above all, um, uh, one of the things that meet that prevents it from working um, is the fact that the Pedicilinsko Pravlinia has this this nasty habit of basically seizing land that the Kyrgyz, by which he means both Kazakhs and Kyrgyz, have already brought under cultivation. Um, in other words, they're, they're seizing their kastau, or their zimovki, uh, which are, have become the basis for, um, um, basically for, for permanent settlements and for permanent settled agriculture. And they're taking that land, which has already been broken in, which has already been irrigated, and they're giving it to settlers, and they're sending you know, expelling the Kazakhs and Kyrgyz from it and sending them elsewhere. And this is hugely, um, hugely explosive. Um, how does the central government react? They basically just ignore what Palin has to say. So this um, is a record again from that journal, the Prosi Kolonizatsi, of how um, uh, a commission set up to explore new legal structures for Pilsilini in the steppe 
uh, responds to Palin. Um, as for the negative regard of the senator sent to inspect Turkestan towards all types of normi rovanje, uh, of the use of land, the commission notes that all of our land organization policies are based upon these very norms. In other words, how dare he question this sort of technocratic ethos? Nor can the commission agree with the conclusion of the inspecting senator that the current order of defining land not needed is lishki by the Kyrgyz is damaging to the latter and of no benefit to the state. Finding instead that prolonged and broad experience of land distribution work sooner gives us the right to come to the opposite conclusion, at least so far as concerns the interests of the indigenous population of the steppe provinces. The introduction of settlers to the steppe has brought about the development of agriculture and the culture of pastoralism amongst Kyrgyz. So basically they just completely ignore it. Um, the link between the um, uh, the uh, the link between um, settlement uh, and the sort of longer-term inclusion of Central Asia within the general um, constitutional structures of the empire is made absolutely explicit in this quotation from Alexander Kriboshin. Kriboshin visits Turkestan in 1912. He produces this zapiska, this text, which becomes quite well known, in which he lays out his vision for what he calls a new Turkestan. And this new Turkestan is going to have a million Russian settlers, um, it's going to have vastly extended irrigation, it's going to be growing more cotton uh, for the Russian Empire. Um, and um, he considers briefly in this um, a suggestion that had also been made by Palin um, in, his, uh, um, in his report to introduce Zemstvas. So Zemstvas are, you know, the provincial elected assemblies that exist in European Russia, but have never been extended to Central Asia because Central Asia is sort of considered to be a colony. It's outside the main um, sort of civic structures of the Russian Empire. And he says, the question of the substitution of military with general civil rule um, to, in Turkestan, or the proposal of Count Palin for the introduction of Zemstvas to the region, appears distant and comparatively minor. Both the former and the latter reform are matters for the future. Both are useful, good and beneficial, but only with a sufficient Russian population in the region. In other words, political rights will be tied to the number of settlers. Um, and the logic then that lies behind that whole process of settlement, the settlers have a greater right to the land than the indigenous population, the settlers will bring political rights with them that are denied to the indigenous population, um, uh, um, is, is made very, very clear in that passage, and also shows how much um, Russian settler colonialism has in common with its British or its French counterparts. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a couple of um, uh, thoughts. Um, one of them is based on this photograph, which I opened the lecture from the Prokudin Gorsky collection, which shows a group of settlers on a small on a small holding in the settlement of Nadezhdinska in the Hungry Steppe. This is um, uh, a region um, uh, basically sort of north of Jizak, now now divided between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Um, so we see a group of settlers here sitting in front of their house, um, and obviously they're all wearing European clothing, and the house is broadly speaking in the European style. But if you look closely, you'll see some things that they've clearly borrowed from local practice. So one of them is that the, the house is surrounded by poplars. Uh, these have been grown as a windbreak, and that's very much a uh, Central Asian technique. Um, another is that the house is roofed with reeds, with kamish, this is a local building material. It's not something that's used um, in, in, in Russia. And finally, the wall behind them is clearly built out of blocks of pachsa, um, uh, which is um, sun-dried brick uh, of mud mixed with straw. Again, um, a local building technique. Um, relations between Russians and settlers are not uh, between uh, set, uh, Russian settlers and the local population are not uniformly hostile, as we can see. They do learn from each other. In the periods perhaps before 1906, when the number of settlers is still relatively low, um, uh, there's a good deal of symbiosis of cultural exchange. The huge expansion in the number of settlers after 1906 puts that relationship under enormous strain. Um, and it's that uh, strain which um, ultimately leads to the outbreak of the revolt in 1916, uh, which you'll hear about in a later lecture, um, uh, produced by um, growing discontent amongst Kyrgyz and Kazakhs about the number of peasant settlers um, uh, and um, provoking more and more uh, violence and the everyday reactions between them, which spills over in 1916 into something very, very nasty indeed. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, and, um, uh, well, 
you'll be hearing from me again.